Now, you've been a wonderful audience, so I'm going to leave you on this one. <laughs> Sometimes it makes me sad. But then I have to remind myself that some birds aren't meant to be caged. Their feathers are just too bright. This is the incredible true story of how I came to be fired from pets at home. <laughs> So I should introduce myself formally. My name's uh, Charlie. I'm West Yorkshire's uh, fifth most successful Morgan Freeman lookalike. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before that, though, I used to work in a school as a, a teacher, a maths teacher. Uh, do we have anyone in tonight who also uh, went to school? <laughs> uh, I had to cover a number of subjects. They're like uh, sexual education uh, with uh, David Attenborough. <clears throat> New science. <laughs> <laughs> and new technology <laughs> allows us to travel further <laughs> and deeper. cover in a Friday afternoon, bottom set, and I thought this would be a good time to introduce them uh, to the Dead Poets Society with Robin Williams. Oh yes. Come on in boys, gather around. <laughs> <laughs> and read from Uncle Walt, Uncle Walt Whitman, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and it's a class, you may refer to me as Mr. Keating, or if you want down. My captain. <laughs> now, what I learned very quickly is that uh, what works in a fictional 1950s American prep school uh, doesn't necessarily translate <laughs> directly to a very rude <coughs> Doncaster comprehensive. <laughs> so the Dead Poet Society is the Robin Williams film that I wanted, uh, the Robin Williams film I got, Jumanji. <laughs> went home and I watched uh, the BBC series uh, Peaky Blinders. Uh Big Blue Alien Movie Avatar. Like me, you might have been very excited at the prospect of a sequel on the horizon, but at this point, I don't think any of us thought it was going to come out. But as we start to look elsewhere, Cameron pulls the rug out from under you saying, here, look at these new screenshots, new technology, industry shaking innovation, and you know what? He could be onto something. Let's dive into the innovations behind Avatar 2 and why it could change movies forever. A quick recap, James Cameron's Avatar, no not that one, was the 2009 epic science fiction film about humans colonizing a new planet called Pandora, and our main character Jake ends up becoming the savior of the local populace, the Na'vi, from his own people and their greedy colonialist ways. I wonder where I've heard that before. The film took reportedly around 15 years to make, and upon its release became the highest grossing film of all time until Avengers Endgame took that title in 2009. 19. James Cameron was supposed to begin work on Avatar straight after his previous box office break in film Titanic in 1997, set for release in 1999. But according to Cameron, the necessary technology was not yet available to achieve his vision of his film. And that's not even mentioning how difficult it was to get funding for something this ambitious. You see, the film was described as a hybrid, with a full live-action shoot in combination with computer-generated characters and live environments integrated within a 3D experience. Remember the 3D movie craze? James Cameron really wanted to achieve these incredibly realistic and immersive CG versions of these environments and characters in the film, so they used advanced motion capture. I'm sure you know of motion capture by now. It's regularly used for some of the biggest blockbusters today, especially by Marvel. But motion capture wasn't a new thing that James Cameron invented. He didn't even really popularize it. Video games have been used 
using this technique to assist with animation for a long time. The first feature film to use motion capture was Star Wars The Phantom Menace to create Jar Jar Binks, which then snowed. Controversial fights of 2009 took place between Antonio Margarito and Shane Mosley. That an illegal pet was found in Margarito's gloves. The trouble began in Margarito's locker room. His trainer, Javier Capatillo, wrapped Margarito's hand while Nassim Richardson looked on. Nassim Richardson saw something peculiar with the padding, so he checked it and a block fell out. The commissioner flipped it open and a block fell out of it. The fight continued anyways and Mosley put a vicious beat down on Margarito. Margarito is getting hit flush with every right hand. There's another one. There's a big left hook. Why not stop it now? And there's the white towel from the corner and Shane Mosley. The controversy surrounding this fight brought up more questions about his previous bouts. How long has this been going on, and did Margarito know what was going on? What made things worse is Margarito never took any responsibility for his actions. Antonio Margarito has said that Manny Pacquiao better be ready for war. Pacquiao always is. On fight night, Manny Pacquiao gave Antonio Margarito the worst beatdown he's ever received. Already it has been a tumultuous evening in Cowboys Stadium. And, here comes and he Manny. turns it around and bangs Margarito deeply. Left cross straight on the bad eye. And another one right on that badly bruised right eye of Margarito. Pacquiao hits him again with the left. Margarito nods at him. Pacquiao hits him at will. Bang! No. Pacquiao hits him with a big left hand. And then flurries and backs Margarito off again. He's beating Margarito up in this game. And a huge left under Margarito's right eye. He's backing Margarito up and he's hurting him. To win the fight, even though he's hopelessly behind and getting no, okay. The first moment that Margarito actually made it look for a moment like his fight against Cotto, and here comes back out. As always. He loves to answer back. And absorb the punches a little better than the smaller one. Right behind him, and he's going to physically continue. And this one, what right up. That is, what he's he's ready, ready to go. Oh, and we're done. Jim, your prediction was right. Margarito has a vicious beatdown to remember. And the satisfaction of having finished the fight. When De La Hoya announced the fight was